I V M. Welcome to Dreaming with Your Eyes Open. Ronnie Scruvala is an entrepreneur who I have admired for a long time. His ability to make inroads in an industry that is so tightly controlled by a few was what first had me so impressed. When he released his book a few years ago, I lapped it up. I was even more impressed. The more I discovered his journey and the various businesses he had been a part of, the deeper my admiration went. When this project came up, I jumped on it wholeheartedly. Where else was I going to get the opportunity to spend so much time discussing the ins and outs of his career and what he has accomplished? In this first episode, we discuss his start, where he came from, and how that informed what he wound up doing. I hope you enjoy this conversation. Hi, Ronnie. So I think you know. I mean, like, let's start at the start, right? And at the start of the book, you say in the thanks section, "I never thought I would write a book." Why did you decide to write a book? I mean, like, you have all the other media possibilities in the world available to you. Why a book? No, actually, fundamentally, writing a book has a lot of discipline. I mean, there's a lot of preparatory work. You need to do a lot of homework. You need to pen your thoughts. Then time has to flow. So just there's a lot of discipline and a lot of rigor right. uh, in writing a book. So, so to that extent, I don't think I have that. I okay. think I'm when I get to communicating, I'm somebody who doesn't write a speech down. Mm-hmm. I always, when I'm giving a talk somewhere, it's much more impromptu. Right. So in that extent, to convert that into a book would have been quite a, a challenge. So that's my first. I think the second one is I just don't see myself as an author. Okay. But in a sense, because storytelling is what it is, mm-hmm. that's what kind of got there. And I, I was looking at it more like, should I do a talk show or I do something like that. And then finally, one or two people in, in my in the company uh, came and said, no, I think you should structure it and write a book. Right. I, I think that's what's actually proven to be really valuable about it. The fact that it is, and I, I speak to a lot of people and most people who I speak to who are entrepreneurial in this space really look at this book as like kind of a really important thing that they've read and something that's really been inspiring to a lot of them. So I think that a book is a unique thing in that sense that... um, Yeah, it kind of documents, as I said, and it brings about a rigor and discipline. It forces you to summarize everything else. Then you need to chop and change, condense it, tighten it, sharpen it. Okay. All right. Yeah, no, I think that makes sense. Uh, Moving on from there, you were talking about the chronology section, right? And over there, you uh, there's a quote you wrote over here. My entrepreneurial journey spans 25 years to date. My first serious business venture was pioneering cable TV in India in the early 1980s before stumbling onto manufacturing toothbrushes later in the decade. Uh, that business, Laser Brushes, grew to be one of the largest of its kind. So I think before we get into this piece, uh, could you just tell people a little bit about like what are the various things you've done and how you got to today, right? I mean, like, what is the chronology in brief? I think chronology was, um, I failed in my intercollegiate in school. Right. uh, And that can wipe a lot of confidence off people. Um, And I suppose it did to a certain extent, but it also taught me a lot of resilience. Mm -hmm. Uh, It gave me a little bit of benchmark on how I viewed education versus on the job experience. Mm -hmm. I think the next chronology for me was just to decide that I want to do something on my own. And I think that combination happened between a pressure of doing higher studies or not, and a crossroad of that, and and a time-given zone in which I needed to decide that, mm-hmm. and taking on a job. Right. Um, I decided to pass on the deeper learning, and I decided to indulge my parents at that time by taking on a job. In my mind, that was the only thing I ever did with a precondition that let me see how I feel for three months. What job was this? Uh, I, so I, I started working in a uh, chartered accountancy firm as an as a trainee for an articles clerk. Oh, okay. So for you, about two or three months. Were you going? To, was that the attempt? You were going to go for a CA? Yeah, that's because I, you know, the the attempt was to get me to do my chartered accountancy. Okay. Uh, and then I did about three months stint uh, in the copywriting department of an advertising agency. Okay. Both very pleasant experiences, no question about that. But even deeper clarity that I just wasn't there to implement somebody else's vision and I wanted to do something of my own. Hmm. But almost equally clear that I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. So how did you, uh, again, when I was looking through the chronology, right? I mean, like cable TV was the first thing you did, right? How did you come to that? Yeah, so when I got into that entrepreneurial venture, I started off by uh, working with my um, now ex-father-in-law. Okay. And at that time, he had a post-production studio. And so, we, so to me, that was part of my starting of my entrepreneurial journey. But there wasn't that much that I would want to do or do in that particular business. Mm. Uh, and therefore, we, I was looking for that branching out right. in that context. And I think cable TV just happened. It's, it's a little bit like, you know, most of the business ideas that come to entrepreneurs today. There's a need gap. Mm-hmm. You see a need gap and it's half because of your personal experience 
you know, somebody walked out of a building, couldn't find a cab, then decided to form Uber kind of situation. Right. It was very evident at that time that um, uh, I was hosting shows on Doodashan and I could see that this was a single channel environment. And yet, when you travel abroad, you had multiplicity of choice. So I think it's a combination of that idea and wanting to do something different. And from there to jump into the uh, the toothbrush business, right? I mean, like uh, the story is really amusing when you, the way you tell it about. Uh, and actually, why don't you tell it, right? I mean, like the story of how you decided that you're the story of getting the the machine. I think it was much more a story of being opportunistic. That's, and I think I've, I've sort of covered that in my book by saying that you know at that naive stage you can ask a lot of dumb questions, mm-hmm. and they can be perfectly fine, and right. you have a license to do that. And you can also be opportunistic in a sense. See, opportunistic is about a sizing up an opportunity it's about then acting and seizing that opportunity but it's also that in the process between uh, sort of spotting it and acting on it there's got to be some real tough decisions and hard work that right. need to happen and i think um the the context there as far as two brushes was that i could see an opportunity not because i found a market mm-hmm. Not because there was a need, not because I felt that I was brushing my teeth in India and felt all toothbrushes were substandard. (laughs) But it was an opportunity on the other side where somebody on the manufacturing side was discarding what I considered great technology out in two years. So it was more that sort of bell going on in my mind. So to me, like it's a very different business from most of the rest of the businesses that you've done, right? I felt like the toothbrush business did seem somewhat like you saw an opportunity and you went for that. Whereas most of the other things seem like, yeah, you definitely see an opportunity to see a gap, but they feel like more traditionally passion-driven businesses, right? Than something well, yes like and this no. would be. You were less and yes and no. I think yes. I think I've been fortunate, and most people think that since you're in businesses like media or cable TV or home shopping, those would they just sound like more fun, and Glamorous. therefore there'd be a lot more passion to them. Right. I think building a brand, building a manufacturing outfit is also equally can be can have an equal amount of passion mm-hmm. in it. So I think um, one looks at the business side of it, and I think. It, the one I would say the other one would be more glamorous, but right. I don't think less passionate. Yeah, no, I would agree with that. I think that there is a certain uh, glamour that people see in the less. Uh, I, I guess there's for the a, first five days of when they enter a sector like the media, <laughs> on the sixth day all the glamour goes, goes away. I, I can under, I can understand that. So uh, from there you move to start. Uh, UTV was your next thing at that point in time, right? For, yeah. After the after yeah. the TV station. So again, when you started UTV, what was the driving force behind looking at that as something you wanted to start? Right. So I think that was really the felt that I think what it was I wanted to do in the long run, mm-hmm. and I think the long haul for me uh, at that stage was you know nobody could even pronounce media and entertainment at that mm-hmm. stage, but I think it was more my combination, my theater days, a combination of my um, cable days, mm-hmm. a combination of my hobbies of front of camera hosting on a single channel. And all of that kind of just came together and said, maybe we should form a company mm-hmm. that is in the production business. Right. And actually, uh, the similarity when you asked me the previous question on toothbrushes versus that, uh, they're all sort of with a lot of B2B mindset in mind. Mm-hmm. So the toothbrushes was, I wasn't going to go out and create a brand. I was going to manufacture contract manufacture for other people. Right. And similarly in media, it was same, the B2B approach, and which was, I wasn't going to go out and launch a channel, though at that time there was no channel that right. was launched. The first channel was in 1992, two years later when Z came about. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it was much more the B2B, one, why don't I become a production house? Right. Uh, and again, that DNA comes from a first generation entrepreneur. When you have zero capital, right. you have zero access to capital. Mm-hmm. Even if you tried to get debt or venture capital, there wasn't that ecosystem. Mm-hmm. And therefore, B2B has to come naturally to your mind because you're the first fundamentally not have this romance that says I have a great idea. Right. You need to actually have a business that starts making uh, cash revenue from day one. Right, right. But you did shift from B2B. I think your next step from there much was later, to go to B2C. Much later, much but I mean, later. Like, from UTV, your next step was into the B2C businesses, right? I mean, like you did UTV for, I think... No, the UTV for the longest time, I think. Right. But in, the UTV transformed from a B2B to a B2C. Right. But that was at the time in, by which time one could take bigger risks. Uh-huh. We were at a bigger scale. Right. And we had funding. Okay. And uh, right after, uh, as part of the UTV thing, I think you started the home shopping thing, which came fairly close uh, after... B- you were converting from a B2B to a B2C, the home shopping thing came fairly close. I, know. I think home shopping was actually a separate outfit. It was never housed in UTV. Okay. It was one of those, again, situations where 
I had a media background. Mm-hmm. Infomercials is how you sell home shopping. Right. So to me, I felt that was very close to media. And we were a production house in the B2B sector. So why not look at something where we could do that? Again, inspired by a couple of models overseas and felt, wow, this can do in India. Okay. But one of my many, many, many failures. Right. Okay. Uh, well, not so many. I mean, like more. I mean, like there are, but there have been a lot of successes. Which, are, if you're going to take chances, you're going to in have, the final analysis. Right. There, there are success, but in the process of things, there right. are ultimate amount of failures. Fair and the only difference that defines success from failure is I, if any of those ninety nine failures I stopped at, mm-hmm. it would be a failure. That is true. But since I carried on, and the hundred then became a cumulative success, <laughs> that's why the ninety nine don't look that. <laughs> That much in the spotlight. Yeah, and I think that's really the critical differentiation uh, of, of an entrepreneur's okay. streak. So I, I think we should update things a little bit, right? I mean, like the book kind of ends at the point when you're going to start your new innings, if you will, right? Yeah. yeah. So let's talk about what you've been doing since you have uh, moved on from UTV, right? I mean, like... Yeah. So I think 2012, early 2012 is when one decided to, and actually the, the, the transaction got completed, where I divested my stake mm-hmm. uh, to the Walt Disney Company. And I think uh, the next um, two years was a well, it was a longer commitment uh, uh, of five years actually right. to be the managing director of the joint entity of Disney and UTV. But I think at the end of the first year, I was again very clear, uh, as much as I was maybe thirty years back when I was starting to be an entrepreneur, mm-hmm. that I'm not the guy to implement somebody else's vision. And I think that dawned on me in a year's time. Even though I think Disney is a fantastic place incredible amount of learnings. In those two years, I learned almost what I learned in 25 years. Great companies supported a lot in the entrepreneurial thought process. Uh, During that time, I think I was so immersed with building and joining the cultures of the two organizations, Mm -hmm. which was definitely a huge challenge as far as I was concerned. And then the only thing I could do at that stage was private equity Mm -hmm. uh, on the side on a weekend uh, in a sort of an arm's length basis. But I think at the end of the first year, I realized that means in the end of 2013, I realized I wouldn't, I couldn't act on somebody else's vision. Then it took another full year for me to transition out and have the right team in place to be able to do that in a very, very smooth and professional mm-hmm. manner because I owed it to everyone concerned as far as right. that was concerned. But by which time I wasn't really concerned what I was going to do after. Okay. I think I took about um, a 10 day break, which is about the longest I took cumulatively <laughs> in the last 25 years. <laughs> Uh, and came to the conclusion that even if I were to do things like being a private equity right. and the option was, which a lot of first generation entrepreneurs today who've cashed out feel, okay, why don't I become a VC? Right. It just wasn't exciting for me. I okay. think I wanted to build ground upwards. Mm-hmm. And I was very clear that this time I have the choice on a couple of things. One, for me, creating impact in whatever I wanted to do uh, was important. Mm-hmm. And the second one was I should want to do it and not have to do it. Right. And I think in your first cycle and plus when you're a listed company plus many other things and you raise capital from people there's always a mixture of between what you want to do and what you have to do right so i think those are my two criterions mm-hmm. uh, and then i went about the, and i wanted to go out and build businesses i didn't want to do a single activity mm-hmm. and therefore i had to have co-founders so these were some of the clarities that came to me very quickly that i can't be a venture capital i can't again as much as i'm not good to implement somebody's mm-hmm. vision i'm not great at investing everything that I've got into somebody else's vision. Because right. if I work with an entrepreneur, I'm very happy to do that. But it's that person's vision uh, that I'm backing. It's, and, you know, it's their job to take two of my 10 suggestions, not 10 of 10 of them. Right. Otherwise, frankly, uh, you know, I wouldn't be respecting that entrepreneur. So that it's not a thankless job, but it wasn't a meaningful enough job mm. for me. I wasn't getting excited by going out and raising a billion dollar fund. Uh, and then the next journey was very clear. And a, a major part of the criterion for me to actually go out and have co-founders on the businesses was because by that time, I'd strongly committed into our not-for-profits with Ace right. Foundation. So if I knew that I was going to spend 30 to 35% of my time on the on not-for-profit, I couldn't possibly go out to be a CEO of a company right. because I'd be letting the team down, possible future investors down because you need to be 110% committed right, to that business. Right, right. So, but I mean, like the things that you have been looking at since uh, Disney, I mean, like I, uh, you, you've you been active in the sports arena, you've been active in the educational arena, and recently you've been active again in the film arena, right? I mean, like, so are these things which you still feel like that you really want to kind of spend that kind of, uh, that, that much time and effort on? Uh, yeah, were you, were you I that think, pleased I think with it? Time and effort is is great. Great yeah. if you are in, enjoying it. Okay. If If the criterion is 99% of the time you're doing things that you want to do and not have to do. Right. And I think uh, the not-for-profit for me is high impact. Mm-hmm. 
the, the online education and upgrade for me is very high impact. Okay. It's impacting people's lives at a very different stage in their career. I think sports for me is high impact mm-hmm. uh, because it's not cricket mm-hmm. where even if I was the 110th person buying a team or whatever else, the ecosystem is so advanced and right. so mature that there's not much I can do. Right. So for me, starting up with what I would call underdog sports mm-hmm. or whatever else, whether it's been up cover or volleyball right. to a little extent. Oh, football. you're doing volleyball tonight. Yeah, we just had a volleyball, about the volleyball league, which is carrying on right now. Oh, we have okay. a volleyball team. It was exciting. So okay. that to me is high impact because right. you're – you're, you're, you're creating an entire new ecosystem. Uh, there are a lot of players that are, that then can become household names. Mm-hmm. And I think in Kabaddi, they've become that. We've just finished one season of volleyball. Yes, uh, tomorrow, day after the end. Okay. And I think in two years time, you know, we'll have household names in volleyball and so on and so forth. And lastly, in the media, uh, specifically in the movie space, mm-hmm. I think my, yeah, it was, it was a little bit of unfinished business. Okay. Um, in the stories that one would have, the, that, you know, the RSVP brand for me is a combination of stories that must be told, stories that I would love to tell, and stories that people go to the movies for. Right. Uh, and between these three categories, the scripts that we choose, the director's vision that we back has to fit into them. And they're all in the categories of what one wants to do. There's no pressure. I don't take any funding from outside. I'm not reliant on anyone. I'm not accountable to anyone. I say no more often than I say yes. And I think that works well. That's a great place to be in. And I think that's a good place to stop the first episode. Uh, thank you very much, Ronnie. And uh, we'll be back next week with another episode. Lovely. Thank you. How does one separate news from opinion? I'm Maharo Khanayat, a news junkie, but not a big fan of debates. I love facts and I like to stick to them. No frills, just pure analysis. This election season, is Balakot a game changer for 2019? Did Priyanka Gandhi Vadra join politics too late? The Chokidar Wars, who's really winning? I will cut the clutter and analyze the stories that matter to you. You can listen to the show on the IVM Podcasts app or wherever you get your podcasts. Sachin Tendulkar, Virat Kohli, Don Bradman, and now Cyrus Brocha. Okay, probably not in the right company. I mean, Don Bradman is Australian. But it's called Cyrus Says, a wonderful show about everything. Find the show on the IVM Podcast app, ivmpodcast.com, or wherever you listen to podcasts.